light. Oh, where is the light? Kindle it with the burning flame of desire. There is the lamp, but never the flicker of a flame. Is such thy fate, my heart? Ah, death were better by far for thee. Misery knocks at thy door, and her message is that thy lord is wakeful, and he calls thee to a love tryst through the darkness of night. The sky is overcast with clouds, and the rain is ceaseless. I know not what this is that stirs in me. I know not its meaning. A moment's flash of lightning drags down a deeper gloom on my sight, and my heart gropes for the path to where the music of the night calls me. Light! Oh, where is the light? Kindle it with the burning fire of desire. It thunders and the wind rushes, screaming through the void. The night is black as a black stone. Let not the hours pass by in the dark. Kindle the lamp of love with your life. A garland of verse, words and music on Shanti Niketan. Tagore's home for over 40 years. Woven and presented by Melville DeMello. Shanti Niketan. Abode of Peace. Shantini Ketan is not only a name, but an emotion. It is a poem, and it began as a poem, with a lump in the throat. As the great sage of 19th century Bengal, Maharishi Dabendranath Tagore, one of the outstanding spiritual leaders of his time, sat in meditation under the two chatim trees, hot and tired, after a cramped palanquin ride about the 60s of the last century. The sun was setting when the Maharishi came to the spot and the two chatim trees were smothered in white flowering creepers. Here he meditated in the cool twilight under the blossom-laden trees. Here he sat in an effort to find peace and fulfillment, listening to the liquid notes of a flute played by a wandering Santal cowherd. Here he sat, as the moon sneaked out behind a cloud. Here he sat, alone, far from the bright trinkets of civilization. For the night coolness flowed like water, and a great peace descended as he prayed. Dawn inched up. Sun and dew began to tinsel the leaves of the chatim trees. The Maharishi was still wrapped in prayer. His night was filled to overflowing with the joy and the love of God. His first words as he rose from his seat of meditation were, this is my place of rest, the end of my pilgrimage. He remained there year after year and he gave it a name. Shantini Ketan, he called it. The abode of peace. Here then lived Maharishi Davendranath Tagore, the father of the poet, during the closing years of his life. All the ugliness of the outer world was shut away from Shantani Ketan. It was timeless. The solitude was complete.
Tagore's father dedicated this lonely spot as the one suitable for his life of communion with God. This place, with a permanent endowment, he dedicated to the use of those who seek peace and seclusion for meditation and prayer. It was 100 miles from Calcutta. 100 miles from the shattering cacophony of the second city of the Commonwealth. Sprawling, brawling, teeming, screaming, ever-growing, never-resting Calcutta. Here at Chantani Ketan, he found in the center of a vast, flat world, the opal of solitude, at the feet of two trees that stood arm in arm, washed in space. In March 1863, he built a guest house and a temple and dedicated his newly founded ashram to his countrymen without distinction of creed and caste. Image worship was forbidden. Vegetarianism and temperance were insisted upon. The two Chatham trees under which the Maharishi sat in meditation became the heart of the ashram. The slab under the trees bears his prayer in Bengali. He is the repose of my life, the joy of my heart, the peace of my soul. Here he built a house, which he named Shantani Ketan. He then laid out an orchard about it and built a temple for non-denominational worship. But for the most part, the long silences of this early Shantani Ketan were only occasionally broken by the Santal folk dancers at festival time. Rabindranath Tagore, according to his own testimony, had his first real taste of freedom at Shantani Ketan, on the first lap of a journey to the snow-capped Himalayas with his father. He was eleven, and the few days that they broke journey at the abode of peace were filled with wonderment as he roamed the ravines, scooping up attractive pebbles, building his sand castles, or pausing to listen to the plaintive flute and thrum of drum that came from the dusty village huts of simple and unspoilt Santal aboriginals as the blue and grey smoke rose lazily to the grasp of the wind in the saffron dusk. Here he built his sand castles, but unlike the pebbles that he soon discarded for prettier ones, his sand castles did not vanish with the first tidal wave of Himalayan splendor. In 1901, Rabindranath Tagore's life took a dramatic and decisive turn. Somewhere, perhaps, he saw in a vision his unfinished sandcastles. Heard, perhaps, his father's voice. His was a life of ease, with freedom to indulge his literary pursuits. But something had died in him. He was unhappy. He must build anew. The sand castles beckoned. The pebbles that once bulged his boyhood pockets now became sermons. And the flute music that haunted him were the thrush-like vocal offerings of little children. He said somewhere, At last, it became clear to me that I should found a school which should be different from the schools wherein I had been instructed as a boy. The school life which I had experienced in my early days had been most distasteful to me, and I had played truant from it wherever I was able to do so. This then seemed to be my mission, to have a school where I could make children happy and give them as much freedom as I possibly could.
Rabindranath Tagore had always been fascinated by the forest homes of the Tapawana of ancient India. Here was a tradition of simplicity and externals combined with the highest aims of life. Under the shade of trees, in the open country, far from the turmoil of cities, the teachers will carry on their own studies and teach, and the students will learn and grow up in an atmosphere of peace and quietness. There was but one place where this image would grow, Shantini Ketan. And so in 1901, Rabindranath Tagore, with but five students, started a school at Shantaniketan. Here would be developed the complete man and woman. But the dream would never be completely fulfilled unless it embraced the whole world. And so, with this end in view, he carried out a reorientation of the school in 1921 and founded Vishva Bharati, where the whole world finds its home in one single nest. And so, even today, you will find the girls of Shantiniketan making a vocal offering for a Merry Christmas, sung perhaps in German. One single nest. The world responded. C.F. Andrews wrote thus of his beloved Shantani Ketan from Central Africa. If I were to make a full confession to you and were to tell you what is in my inmost heart, you would find hidden deep down there an inextinguishable longing to be away from the tumult and the strife of tongues and to be back again once more beneath the sal trees and the mango groves of Shanti Niketan where the children sing their songs and play their games and do their work where the spirit of peace and beauty reigns supreme where the open sky is spread out over our heads in all its infinite mystery with its sunrises and sunsets, with its full moonlit beauty at night, and those wonderful dark purple evenings when the stars come out one by one and seem to stoop down to earth to whisper their secrets into the ears of mortal men. We find in England, in the beautiful valley where the ruined walls of Tintern Abbey still remain, something of this same sacredness, which can be almost felt a beauty of the inner world as well as the outer scene. Wordsworth felt it, and this sense of spiritual presence inspired one of his most perfect poems. There is no happier life in India than that of the children at Shanti Niketan. Vishwa Bharati, an international university. Its aims and objects? To seek to realize in a common fellowship of study the meeting of East and West and thus ultimately to strengthen the fundamental conditions of world peace. Here, with whitened hair, desires failing, strength ebbing out of him, but with serenity and only the calm warning of the evening star left to him, he held tenaciously to the thing he cherished most, his Shantini Ketan. This fountainhead to which he returned again and again for solitude, 
solace, strength, inspiration, but mostly for peace. This Shantani Ketan, where the landscape listens and shadows hold their breath, where children walk like slender Easter lilies. This Shantani Ketan, he so touchingly described in his last letter to Mahatma Gandhi. Like a vessel carrying the cargo of my life's best treasures. Here at Shantani Ketan, with eyes closed, he would sit under the Chatham trees as the divine service rolled magnificently over the wide open spaces. Chantani Ketan, the child was to be given the fullest opportunity of self-expression. Not for this generation the mere language of words. They would seek expression in other languages, lines and colors, sounds and movement. To know men and to make oneself known to man. And that sentiment throbs through his lines in his key poem, Gitanjali. Thou hast made me known to friends whom I knew not. Thou hast given me seats in homes not my own. Thou hast brought the distant near and made a brother of the stranger. When one knows thee, then alien there is none. Then no door is shut. Oh, grant me my prayer that I may never lose the bliss of the touch of the one in the play of the many. And so Shantidi Ketan expanded in size and ideas. For Tagore envisaged our country as a cradle of cultures, a mother of nations. <laughs> Brick by brick, Rabindranath built his Shantani Ketan. The growth of the school was the growth of his life. Its ever-growing needs drained his resources steadily. Tagore gave all he had, leading the life almost of an ascetic. 
He sold his wife's ornaments with her happy consent. His coach and pair, his library, his bungalow at Puri, almost everything he could lay his hands on. Amritamaya Purusha Sarvanuhu Yashchaya Masmin Atmani Tejo Maya Amritamaya Purusha Sarvanuhu Tameva Viditva Timrityumeti Nanya Pantha Vidyate Most of the songs of Gitanjali were written at Shantini Ketan. These were sung to the boys and girls who came in crowds to learn them under the stars or the moon at the feet of the master. Nobody ever stopped a child from meeting Tagore. Nobody ever thought of it. They sing his songs today. Roaming the campus under the deep shade of the trees he planted. Or while jeeping their way from village to village. Shantini Ketan. What had been half a century ago, his saintly father's hermitage, is today the happy, bustling meeting place of many varied creative forces of the world, from north, south, east and west. Scholars and students of national and international repute find in Shantini Ketan a home from home. There was the Hungarian ashramite, who had known Tagore. The greatest charm of Shantiniketan is perhaps the fact that it offers a wonderful opportunity for inward development. The atmosphere with its spiritual association is still a living force. And in the course of time, it almost became a place of pilgrimage where people from all over the world come drawn by the ideals of its fountain poet and this makes it possible to meet people of different ideals from every corner of the globe in a simple informal setting where one has enough leisure and solitude to think and dwell on these ideas. When I go hence, let this be my parting word, that what I have seen is unsurpassable. I shall be born in India again and again, with all her poverty, misery and wretchedness, I love India best. He is there where the tiller is tilling the hard ground, and where the pathmaker is breaking stones. He is with him in sun and in shower, and his garment is covered with dust. Shantani Ketan may have inspired his last prayer. May the bonds of mortality melt away, 
May the vast universe take me in its arms. And may it be given me fearlessly to stand face to face before the great unknown. Sometimes Tagore addressed God in his own person, as in this, perhaps the finest of all the Gatanjali poems, where the sights and sounds of the world are gathered into the inner stillness of the poet's spirit, the music of the soul. Thou art the sky, and thou art the nest as well. O oh, thou beautiful, there in the nest it is thy love that encloses the soul with colours and sounds and odours. There comes the morning with the golden basket in her right hand, bearing the wreath of beauty silently to crown the earth. And there comes the evening over the lonely meadows, deserted by herds, through trackless paths, carrying cool draughts of peace in her golden pitcher from the western ocean of rest. But there, where spreads the infinite sky for the soul to take her flight in, reigns the stainless white radiance. There is no day, nor night, nor form, nor colour. And never, never a word. Thus, out of small beginnings, greater things have been produced by his hand that made all things of nothing and gives being to all things that are. And as one small candle may light a thousand, so the light here kindled hath shone unto many, yea, in some sort of way, to our whole nation and to the world. Fierce rages the storm. But who is it that wins at last? The gentle breeze.